see, if you're looking for demerits, I'm happy to pass them out. Uh, well, welcome everybody. We are back, and we are chugging through the letter of James, the wisdom literature of the New Testament, all about how to be skilled at living your life. It's like reading Proverbs or Ecclesiastes or, or some of the Old Testament wisdom literatures. Since God is who he is, since God has done what he has done, how then are we to live? That's the basic questions that, that James and, and all of the other wisdom writers is, are addressing here. So, before we dig in, let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us together tonight on this beautiful day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who helps us to understand your word. And we ask, as always, that you would send your spirit to be a part of this study, to move among us, to give us wisdom, Lord, and understanding. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive all that you would give to us tonight and help us to be able to apply it to our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So as I said, the, the right way to live, the wise way to live, we've already seen a few major principles on how to do that. We've looked at being able to rejoice even in the midst of suffering. We've looked at the fact that hearing the word and doing the word are two very different things. Who knew, right? There's more to it than just going to church and hearing the word read and the sermon preached. You know, that's not enough. You can't just go and do whatever you want for the rest of the week. Did you know that? No. <laughs> Learn something new every day. I can go home now. No. <laughs> You're staying after and clapping erasers, okay? We'll find erasers for you to clap. We, we, we look at how our faith should produce works. There should be evidence of our faith that you can see that in somebody's life. And last week, everybody's favorite part about having to learn how to control your tongue. And since we studied that, we're all masters of that, right? We must be there. Are we still talking about that? We're still talking about that, and we'll keep talking about it until it works. <laughs> so, today we're going to talk about worldliness. Have you heard that term? Oh, yes. Being worldly is. Do we want to be worldly? I don't think that's a good thing, right? It's not a good okay, thing. Okay, I didn't no. think so. No, it used to be something we talked about much more, about how we want to be godly and holy rather than worldly. But in today's world, we don't talk about it all that often anymore. And we, we see much more people I don't want to cast stones, but maybe if we freshen the church up a little bit and make it a little more like our culture, then, then maybe people will want to come again, yeah. you know? Play that fancy music. Or whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know? So we're going to see here worldliness doing three things. We're going to see how being a friend of the world instead of being a friend of God can lead to um, quarrels and violence even within the church. I know that shocks you that people would fight in the church. Because we've never. Oh, no. <laughs> she's been around a long she, time. She's been around the, this ain't your first rodeo, right? <laughs> And we will see how being friends with the world rather than being friends with God can get in the way of your prayers, can be a, a barrier to your prayers being effective, and it can lead to judgment, particularly hypocritical judgment of other believers. So we're just looking at one passage today, the first 12 verses, chapter 4, and uh, who would like to read that? Lisa, thank you. What 
causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Okay. So, yeah, not a lot in there, right? <laughs> nice, light, fluff passage. We'll get through this in a few minutes. <laughs> See why it's going to take a whole hour. So, we end in chapter 3, the last verse, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we ended with this idea of peacemakers in the church. James now anticipates the next question. Well, I look around, James, and I don't see peacemakers in the church. So what's the problem? I see fights, I see quarrels, I see dissensions. What is the problem there? And that's what he's addressing here in this section. What causes strife and quarrels and enmity within the church? Aren't we all Christians? Shouldn't we all get along with each other and be loving with each other? Well, yes, we should, but we don't, right? Not all the time. So, First off, how comforting that even at the very beginning here, you know, we get this idealized picture in our minds, don't we, about what the, the early church was like. Oh, if I could hear Paul preach, or Peter, oh, it'd be amazing. Oh, I mean, they, they talk with Jesus. You know, it, it would be wonderful. Look, you know, Barnabas, he, he saw there was a problem. He went and sold property and, and donated the money. Can you imagine people doing, being that generous? Oh, and every so often you'll see somebody they're, they're founding a new church and they're saying, we're going we're gonna to be a New Testament church. And that sounds great mm -hmm. until you read the New Testament. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you see what these churches were really like. The churches that James is sending this around to, clearly, they're fighting with each other. Hmm. Go read 1 Corinthians. They're fighting even more with each other. There are at least three factions there. Not only that, they've got a guy sleeping with his stepmother and saying, it's okay because I'm in Christ, so I'm forgiven. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I always want to ask, which New Testament church are you going to be like? Are you going to be like the Corinthians? Because, ooh, they had some issues. So it, to me, it, it, it's comforting in a way that even here at, at the very beginning, in these first couple decades, as they're founding the churches and getting it all going, they're having the same struggles and problems that we have today. They're real people. They're, like us, are wrestling with their sin. 
and slowly, God willing, growing in their faith and becoming more and more Christ-like as the Spirit is at work in their lives. And even then, just as today, I mean, I, I've been a pastor for almost 20 years now, and I firmly believe three quarters, three quarters of all the problems in the church are personality problems. Not theology problems. Not deep, rooted issues. It's, he's annoying, and I don't want to deal with it anymore. She stepped on my toes. She didn't she wish did. me Merry Christmas. I sent her a card, but she clearly didn't send me one, so apparently I don't matter. You know. I said I wanted it done this way, but then they went and did it their own way. Who do they think they are? I mean, it, it's every it, that that's who we are, right? I think you need to up that percentage a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm being optimistic. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's, you know, we all come out of some kind of brokenness. Very few of us were taught well how to deal with anger. Because anger is a very tricky thing, isn't it? The Bible never says don't be angry. The Bible says in your anger do not sin. There are times we should be angry. There are times when it's sinful not to be angry. But none of, very, actually very few of us were probably ever taught a good way to deal with anger. Some of us were taught good little girls and boys aren't angry. So swallow it down, repress it, suppress it, and you can only do that for so long, right? Or Xanax or long. Yeah. Yeah, medicated away. That's the right one, you know. Alcohol. Alcohol. Uh, go to the shooting range and put some holes in papers. <laughs> have some friends. That, yeah. Um, so that you know, some of us were taught that. Some of us are are taught instead. Well, you know, you express your anger whenever. If you're angry, you go right ahead. And let everyone know. Guilty. Yeah, you know. And, and it's true with other emotions too, with, with regret, with frustration. Very few of us are taught what to do with grief, which, whew, that's a heavy one. And, you know, you can have all the training in the world, and until you've done it, you don't know. It's a monster, it's irrational, and it always takes longer than you want it to, you know. So, we, we are taught all kinds of unhealthy ways sometimes to deal with this, and we bring that with us into the church, don't we? And until we take whatever that is and give it to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I have a problem with anger. I'm not angry when I should be, or I'm angry when I shouldn't be. Until, and, and there's, there's all kinds of psalms, proverbs, and other wisdom literature about that. There's pieces in the prophets. At one point, Jeremiah just flat out says, God, you lied to me. You called me to be a prophet, and you said I was going to make a difference. Uh, what gives? Look at these people. I've been preaching at them for how long, and ain't nothing has changed. You lied to me. And he took that anger and he gave it to God, and by the end, he was praising again. Now, we're not told how much time <laughs> elapsed from verse 1 to verse you know, 20 or whatever when he started praising again. But until we learn and say, Lord, I need to learn the Christ-like way to deal with these issues, we're going to continue to act out, aren't we? And you're going to take the burdens that you have and bring them with you and dump them on somebody else. I got up on the wrong side of the bed. It's a little cranky, a little headachy. And so I came and dumped it on poor Judy. <laughs> but you know what? She's dumped hers on me too. So. <laughs> and then it's, here you go, I brought you a donut. <laughs> so 
James here. What causes your quarrels? What causes your fight? Your passions are at war within you. And he makes it as simple as this in verse 2. You desire something and you're not getting it. You want something and you're not getting it. And so you act out in anger. Sounds like a toddler, right? Yeah. Some of us never really grow past that, do we? We learn to put a good face on it, but inside there's that toddler still screaming and throwing a temper tantrum. Because I want attention. <laughs> notice me, I'm wonderful. <laughs> and they don't notice because they're dealing with their own stuff. And so you throw a tantrum and all of a sudden, hey, even bad attention is better than no attention, right? What they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Ask Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to be right all the time. You've met that person, right? No matter what they say, they're right. And they'll argue with you even when they're wrong. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Another demerit. <laughs> I, I want to be respected. I want to be looked up to. I want power. I feel powerless at work or at home. So I'm going to come and be powerful here at church or at my club or, or whatever. Um, above all, we all want pleasure, right? To be honest, we all want pleasure. And when we don't get that, if we're worldly rather than godly, eventually that's going to erupt into a temper tantrum if we don't learn to discipline ourselves, if we don't let God intervene, if we don't grow up. And it leads to violence, not always physical violence, sometimes physical violence. A lot of, when he mentions murder, a lot of murders are, I wanted something and they wouldn't give it to me. Money, attention, respect. I'll wipe that smile off your face, you know. I'll teach you to ignore me. Violence it can be something as simple as that for people who are people of the world rather than people of the Lord. It's You have these violent passions and desires within you that are not submitted and disciplined before the Lord and channeled in godly ways. I've had several friends who when they are parenting their three-year-olds, remind themselves, and I've heard them say out loud, I'm glad that she has a strong will. That will be good for her later in life. However, right now, <laughs> as I'm teaching her how to discipline her strong will, that there are battles not worth fighting, and one of them is with mommy, or daddy, or whatever. I wish her will were just a little bit weaker. You know, you have to channel that, and some of us, we're still learning that. And many of us, when we don't get what we want, we don't fight fair. Who here is a member of the Passive Aggressive Club? That's me. You know what? Please go ahead and take the last piece of cake. You've only had four. <laughs> and I didn't get any, and, and you know, I, but you know what, I, I had a big lunch eight hours ago, so I'm fine. <laughs> fine. Yeah. Things great. No, 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 you do you. No, I want you to be happy. Yeah. Anybody uh, fight through silence? <laughs> Just shut up and don't say anything at all. Mutual explorers. Whatever. <laughs> Your favorite word? Whatever. It'll be fine. It's fine. It's all fine. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. Some, anybody, anybody like the whispering campaign behind the person's back? What, uh, what they all teach you to look out for? The meeting after the meeting? You've had the official meeting, but then there's the meeting in the parking lot afterwards. Gotta watch
watch out for that. Then there's just good old fashioned character assassination. You didn't give me what you want, you're a duty head. <laughs> you know what? Or whatever term you want to substitute in there. Uh, you would just you just attack the other person's character, or parentage, or clothing style, or whatever, you know. Um, and then there's the people that I like to call it the scorched earth policy style of fighting, where you get hurt and everybody else in the room gets hurt and everybody else in the town gets hurt, but they feel better because they've exploded and they've done as much damage as possible and they've spread it around. Uh, we all, we all, if we're not submitting ourselves before the Lord, we struggle with these kinds of problems and it'll split a family, it'll split a church, it'll, it'll ruin a workplace, one person could ruin a workplace, especially a boss, especially a bad manager, who has been promoted according to the Peter Principle. You've heard of the yeah. Peter Principle? Yeah. You get promoted up until your lowest level of incompetence. So you were great at this job, so we're going to promote you now to where you have no idea what you're doing and you don't have the skills. Or maybe you weren't great at all at that job. Or we yeah. just want to get you out of this department. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you were great at the fries, and now we're going to put you on the grill, and really, you should have stayed on fries. Yeah. So all of this, though, all of these things I've been describing, they go against the second great commandment, don't they? Love your neighbor as yourself. All of that I was describing was I love me an awful lot, but you not so much. You know, what I think I'm entitled to, respect, love, money, attention, my way all the time, I think that's far more important than what you need in this situation. And so I'm going to put that first, at all costs. That's what causes quarrels and fights, is... You have done me wrong by not giving me what I want or what I think I need. And it may be something you actually need, but the communication isn't going so well, right? Because I'm fine. I told you, I'm fine. So all of this, you desire and you do not have, so you murder, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. But here's a big principle. You do not have because you do not ask. You have not because you ask not. The question is, have you prayed about it? Corey Tempu, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? <laughs> You can't drive without the steering wheel, right? But when do you need the spare tire? Only when there's a disaster. And a lot of people, prayer is their spare tire. Oh, things are bad, I'd better pray. You have not because you ask not. Have you actually lifted it up to the Lord? This thing that is bothering you. This thing that is hurting you, that is now leading to hurting other people. You've been snapping at everybody all day, have you ever stopped to lift whatever that is up to the Lord and say, Lord, I need help with this. So many of us fail to pray about it, and sometimes we baptize that in holy words. Well, I don't pray for my own needs because that would be selfish. What about when Jesus tells you to pray for your own needs? Is Jesus being selfish? That doesn't sound right. He, he did. He teaches us to pray for our needs. But I've had people actually come and say, I only pray for others. I never pray for myself because I'm not selfish. And it took me aback the first couple times. It's like, I, 
what? I, I don't even know what to say. Now I've thought about it enough, I, I well, no, 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 you're not going down the hall yet until I'm done. Because <laughs> we need to talk about what you just said. <laughs> so, some people, well, I don't pray over little things like that. I only pray over the big things. Let me tell you, I pray for a parking space. <laughs> I do. I do. Espe especially certain places where I know they're hard to find. Yeah. Like, some of it, back when I was still allowed to go to the hospitals, because that still hasn't returned fully, some of those parking garages down in, by the hospitals, it's... Oh, yeah, Lord, um, I, yeah, I, I, I need to put, I can't fold my car up and put it in my pocket. I need to put it somewhere, so. So we, we, we limit sometimes in our minds what God is able to do. And I love this comment. The problem is that takes away the number one most exciting thing about Christianity, that the God of the universe wants to know us, wants to be known by us and cares even about the little details of our lives that he allows us to tap into his power. Is that not the most exciting thing to think about? God wants you to know him and he cares so much about the details of your life that he even offers his power for you to tap into. And we <coughs> don't take advantage of that nearly enough, do we? Not nearly enough. The more we did, the more we would be able to deal with a lot of the problems that we have in our lives and in our churches and at work and at home. So, yes, sir. Ma'am, sorry. Uh, I started the day this week where you were. And uh, he had a great, great point. He said that he thought one of the first sins was really the fact that we forgot that we were creatures and God was the creator. And when we put ourselves outside of being a creature, it's more like um, how great I am instead of how great thou art. Yeah. And come back and realize we're as helpless as can be without his help, without his knowledge, without his direction. Uh, and I, I thought that was a yeah. I never thought of myself as being a creature. I won't would make one but yeah, I never really thought of, you know, I thought I was always a child, not a creature. But when I stop and, and I look at the deer, they have to depend on the foliage and they're not gonna come in and sit down and have a hand. Either gonna, God's gonna provide for them. If they do, you better call the news. Right. <laughs> well, if they get off of my daffodils and my tulips. It was just a, a different way of, of, of approaching it, never yeah. thinking of being a creature of God, knowing that He was a creator, but we are special creatures to God. Yeah. Yeah, we're the only ones made in His image. And I can't help but think every time I struggle with worthiness in God's eyes. God always puts in my head, you know how you feel about your children. That's how I feel about you. Yeah. And it, it always clears things up so much. So that's <coughs> Yeah. And, and when your little daughter came up and, Daddy, will you help me tie my shoes? <laughs> of course. Yeah. You didn't yell at her. Right. <laughs> she needed help. Yeah. She did the right thing. So, but James here said something inter interesting you know, number one, we have not because we ask not. But then you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And that's where I kind of do out this blog post from a friend of mine because I found this very helpful and it summarized. It's not a complete list, obviously, but many of the biblical instructions of how do we sabotage our own prayers? Yes, God answers every one of our prayers. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait. Sometimes we are sabotaging our own prayers 
by the way that we ask in a non-godly way. So I'm just going to summarize real, real quick. First, some people, they're looking for a particular experience. Sometimes you pray, and there is that amazing experience. If you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to explain, but you just, you know God is right there with you. You can feel it. You can sense it. It's amazing. But that doesn't come every single time you pray. And if you think you have to have that experience, then you're going to be disappointed. And you're going to miss a lot of God's answers. So that's the first thing he says. Secondly, we don't pray with persistence. Jesus talks a lot about that, doesn't he? The parable of the persistent widow who kept going before the judge and saying, settle my case, settle my case, settle my case. And finally, the judge got so sick and tired of her that just to get her off his back, he settled the case. And Jesus says, if a wicked, corrupt judge will finally listen to you if you are persistent enough, how much more a loving Heavenly Father who cares about you down to the depths of your core, of course he's going to answer your prayer. But sometimes we say, in Jesus' name, amen, and look around, and we don't see a burning bush appear. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess God doesn't want me to have that. Well, no, maybe God wants you to wrestle with it for a little bit. Maybe God's teaching you something in this experience. Maybe he's teaching you patience and persistence. Maybe you need to keep wrestling with God on this. There's more deeper depths to plumb. you got to keep going before him. Uh, number three, we don't, we don't expect him to answer. Classic example, Zechariah and the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. The one chance he gets, because there are so many priests at this point, that if you are a priest, you get to serve one time in your life, and some never get to serve. It's a lottery at this point. Your number is drawn, and you get to go and offer prayers. This is Zechariah's one time he's going to burn the incense, he's going to say the prayers, he's going to offer the priestly blessing to the people in the temple. This is the highlight of his life. There's one problem, though. He doesn't actually expect God to show up. And God showed up. There's an angel saying, I've heard your prayers. You're going to have a kid. Yes, I know Elizabeth is past the age of menopause, but what is that for God? He, he made that system. He can work around it. And Zechariah doesn't believe it. He didn't expect that God would actually answer his prayers. We pray a lot of times that we move on and don't actually expect peace in Ukraine. Do you think God would actually do something like that? Yeah. I think he would. But sometimes we just say the words and we don't actually we don't actually believe. You said peace for Ukraine? Yes. Just as an example. I know, but I, I, I'm having trouble with that. There's you don't want peace for the Ukrainians? <laughs> but there's got to be millions and millions and millions of people praying the same prayer. Oh, yeah. I have another other prayer, and, and I'm sure God's not going to answer that one, but I want the That's the spirit. to go <laughs> and do their number on the Russian in their costume, but I, I, I just have, I mean, when I see these pictures and, and see what these people are going through, come on, God. I'm Sometimes we, we have to be comfortable with, I put it in God's hands. I don't understand because I don't have all the information and I don't have the brain capacity to wrap my mind around zillions of things going on in the midst of this. But I trust God will do what is right in his time. But I'm going to keep praying for peace because I think, I think God cares about peace. 
It's not a satisfactory answer, I know, but it's the best I have right now. Well, I mean, Pakistan's done their thing, so it's, I, I, no, I, I'd be crying if I was God. That he keep, probably is. Keep at it. Yeah. yeah. We just have to trust that God's hand is, is in it. And there have been way worse things in the Holocaust. In history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're we'll looking at it again. Right. We yeah. might be. I don't know that there are millions of people dead yet. But so, so we pray and we don't always expect to answer. Here he mentions we don't ask. We just talked about that. Or we don't ask appropriately. I think far too often we launch into our laundry list. God, gimme, 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 amen. Which is not the pattern that Jesus gave us, is it? He said, here's how you are to pray. God, you are wonderful, you are wonderful, you are wonderful, you are wonderful. May your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. May heaven match earth. May earth match heaven. Soon. Now. And thank you for now that I have that very firmly in my head who I'm talking to, here's what I need. And I'm going to pray about the past, I'm going to pray about the present, and I'm going to pray about the future. That covers all of it, right? In Jesus' name, amen. But far too often it's gimme, 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 gimme. <laughs> and, and God doesn't always appreciate that, I don't think. Again, going back to the parental thing. Dad, I need money. Dad, I need money. Dad, I need money. Oh, by the way, how are you? Great. Great. I need money. (laughs) You don't appreciate that, do you? It's not asked in in an appropriate way. Here's a big one. If we are harboring sin in our hearts, that can get in the way of our prayers. Because God loves us enough that he wants to deal with that sin because it's getting in the way. So if we are harboring, say, hatred and bitterness because so-and-so, they know what they did, and I'll be happy to forgive them, but they have to come to me first on their knees, (laughs) then I can graciously forgive, but not until then. That is absolutely going to get in the way of your prayers because it's going to get in the way of your relationship with God. And prayer is all about relationship. And God is love. Right? And look at what he's forgiven you. And you're not willing to forgive others. Jesus has a lot to say about that. And so it says in in the Psalms and in 1 Peter that until that roadblock is removed, the prayers are going to be not as effective as they should be. And then the big one, we want to hear from God, but we don't actually read his word. That's the number one way to hear what God has to say. He's written it down for us. It's really handy, really helpful. We want the burning bush and the voice booming from heaven and, you know, the uh, sky writing and and all of that. And God's like, well, you know, I, I... you want to know whether you should sleep with that person that you're not married to? I already told you my thoughts on that. It's pretty clear. No, you shouldn't. You want to know if you should go and punch that person in the face in public? Uh, no. No, you shouldn't do that. That's, that's not the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that <laughs> She said, oh, you should do it in private. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have not because we ask not. We have not because we don't ask appropriately. Another great example, we don't ask for the right things sometimes. James and John coming to Jesus. Remember when we were in Mark. Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can one of us be on your right and one of us be on your left? And Jesus says, you have no idea what you're asking for. Do you think you can do that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do it, Lord. Uh-huh. <laughs> Super great. We'll, 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 we'll do it. We'll blow you away. And Jesus is like, yeah, well, let's wait until 
the kingdom comes and we'll see what happens. And uh, one of my favorite quotes, God answers every prayer. This is from Timothy Keller. God answers every prayer by giving you what you would ask for if you knew all that he knows. And I think that is so true. He gives you what you, exactly what you would ask for if you knew everything he knew. Even about the Ukraine. So, we ask wrongly because... Along with that, that, that you were saying that they never pray? So? There's another saying that, um, what would you think if you woke up in the morning and you had a list of things you thanked God for yesterday? My mom said that to me a while back. It haunted me. You woke up tomorrow and only had the things you thanked God for today. Yeah, that, that gets your attention, doesn't it? Would it would be enough. I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, James goes on to say here, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world, here's the problem. Do you not know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. This is a big problem with our prayers and with our relationships, is which set of values and goals are we pursuing? Because the world's way and God's way are two different ways, right? Psalm 1, blessed are those who are seeking after the Lord in prayer, who are living in wisdom, who are, are, are attending to his word. They're like trees planted by streams of water that are fruitful and due season and well water. Not so the wicked, not so those chasing after the world, not so the, those who scoff at God and scoff at his word. They're like chaff blowing away in the wind, good for nothing. Those are the two ways to go, the world's way and God's way. The world, the flesh, and the devil are usually listed as our three great enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. By world, we mean the broken society and culture that we live in. The world in rebellion against God. Same with the flesh, the parts of us that are still in rebellion against God. Christ has come and has begun to redeem the world, right? He's begun the process of winning the world back for himself and winning us back for himself. But we're in a state of already not yet, as it's often called. We already belong to Christ. We're forgiven. We're healed. We're free. We're blessed. We're broken. But that's not yet complete. The world, he's won the victory at the cross and at the empty tomb. He's going to come back. We know how this is going to end. But the world is still broken and fallen. And we're called to pick. You can't have both. You can't be worldly and godly. You can't ride two horses with one behind, <laughs> as they sometimes say. You got to fish or cut bait. You can't do both. And so many of us, we want to be best buds with God, but we also want to fit in with the world. I'll come on Sunday, and I'll sing all the praises, and I'll say all the prayers, and I will be the best Presbyterian you've ever seen. But come Monday, when I go to the office, you won't be able to tell that I am any different from anybody else. My language is going to be the same. The jokes I make will be just as crude. I'll be just as mean and cutthroat against my fellow colleagues, and if I have to trample over people to get a raise and to get ahead, I'll do it. If I have to fudge the numbers to balance the books, I'll do it. If I have to keep the book we show the government for tax purposes and then the real book, I'll do it. Because that's the way the world does it, right? And it's only wrong if you get caught. Aren't we reenacting the Old Testament that way? I think we're going back to a lot of pagan things. Yeah. Yeah. Like the 
Basketball coach told my sister, it's not a foul unless you draw blood. Oh. Really? Yeah. Wow. He said, don't waste your fouls. Use them. Wow. Yeah, it was a great thing to teach teenage girls. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, believe me, she did. <laughs> so, the world is one of our great enemies, and, and here, you know, do you not know, God yearns jealously over your spirit to dwell with you. He greatly desires for you to be godly rather than worldly, and he gives more grace. There's the good news right there. When you think, boy, I don't know if I can become more godly and less worldly. That sounds really hard. By the way, it is. But he gives more grace. He's at work in you doing even that part of salvation as well. We're called to cooperate with him. But he gives more grace. And he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's a quote from Proverbs 3. Again, the big question, are we living to please the world? Are we living to please God? Do we want to be popular? Do we want to be accepted? Do we want everybody to admire us for our, do we want to be woke? What does that mean? I don't know. It changes every day to be woke. Yeah. It doesn't mean awake. No. That's where it comes oh, yeah. from. Yeah, aware of, of the current. Yeah. What's, what's current? Oh, okay, I'm yeah. not woke. Yeah. If I gotta ask, I guess I'm not. If you gotta ask, you probably are. Yeah. It's like you just ask what's hip. Yeah. Oh, I got it. Yeah, okay. but it's it's having all of the right cultural values, which change all the time. Yeah. And not according, according to any to particular. You. Yeah. According to the world. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Do you, are you living for the approval of the culture, or are you living for the approval of God? Jesus says, all who acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So if you're willing to stand up and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I am a Christian, and I'm going to follow what he teaches, even if that's going to get me into trouble, and it will, <laughs> it has in every age, in every age, being a Christian is countercultural on some way or another. And it's not just having to do with sex. It has to do with every aspect. You know, being a Christian economically, that's going to get you in trouble with people who say the number one thing is to make as much money as possible, right? Well, yes, making a profit is good, but do we have to trample on the poor to do it? You know, I can make a lot of money opening a check cashing place, but that's usually, right? That's evil. That's perpetuating decades and generations of debt and trampling on people in order to make money. Is that Christian? No, I don't think it is. Are you going to make a lot of money doing it? You bet. Not the people that work there every day. Day, right? Oh, not the regular employees. No, no heaven. Who, yes. Christine, who cares about them? Well, exactly. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, being a Christian, it's, we have to choose. And are we, are we going to lift ourselves up in this world, or are we going to lift Christ up? So my mom says, what are you building with your life? Are you building an altar to the Lord, or are you building a monument to yourself? It's one or the other. And this is why the world reacts so strongly against the Christian faith, because the key to Christianity is humbling yourself before God and receiving what he has to give you. And the world's not particularly interested in humbling itself for anything, right? The world's all about lift up yourself, manage your brand, right? Manage your brand. You, you don't have a YouTube channel? <laughs> Why not? Don't you want to be an influencer in the world? A YouTube influencer? So you can build your brand and become a zillionaire by the time you're 35? 
You need that side hustle, right? You got your regular job, but you got to have your side hustle where you are building yourself up so that you can be rich and famous and popular because that's what it's all about, right? If you're not rich and famous and popular, then who are you? You're nobody. And if you don't toot your horn, ain't nobody else going to toot it for you. So you get out there and you put number one first. And Jesus comes along and says, put God first, but others second. He'll take care of the rest. <coughs> love God, love your neighbor, he'll take care of the rest. And that doesn't sound particularly fun. We don't want to bow down. We don't want to submit. We don't want to confess that we are needy. Or as you said it, helpless, creaturely. We don't want to confess that we did anything wrong. Here's a great thing. In my mind, I would much rather hang out with a Christian, someone who's willing to put God first and others second, and God will take care of the rest, than these influencers. Because... They're, they're exhausting. They just are. And, and yeah. I, I, so as I'm thinking about this, I'm like, what? I, I, well, I mean, yeah, I think you're hitting on something because according to the values of the world, it's never enough. You never reach success. Right. And there's no grace. So you tweeted something 15 years ago that's now politically incorrect, there's no forgiveness. We're seeing that now. You're over. Yeah, We've canceled right you. Yeah. You're gone. There's no grace. There's no forgiveness. Now, maybe you should apologize for what you treated 15 years ago. I don't know. Was there even Twitter 15 years ago? I'm not sure. But, but yeah, there are times we say things and, you know what, that was wrong. Forget, you know, at the time, yeah, I was dumb. I was an idiot. I, I didn't know better. Now I've learned. Okay, great. But there's no forgiveness. There's no grace. Thankfully, well, there is. For some there are. Huh? For some there are. They can just say, oh, I'm sorry, I pulled that trigger. Oh, well. <laughs> for a time. Yeah. Right. As long as they're useful. Well, but once you're no longer useful, you're swirling the drain. Well, and that's they exhausting. Their anger, and then they may be, won't be forgiven. The world will measure you according to what they can get from you how much money they can make off of you, how useful and important you are, and that is toxic. That's a great point. Yeah. But in the church, your value is simply in being who you are, created in the image of God. And you may not be particularly useful to me right now, but I still love you, and you're still valuable and important. That's revolutionary. You will not find that in the world. But to gain that, you have to give up me. And it's all about me, right? <laughs> and if it's not all about me, it should be all about me. Because who's more important than me? You see the little kids? I've seen toddlers wearing a shirt that say it's all about me. Get that message off of that kid. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to teach. They already know that, by the way. <laughs> they already believe it. You have to help them unlearn that. Don't reinforce it. Yeah. So resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's the one-two step here. Renounce the world, resist the devil, resist the fleshly desires, the passions within you, and draw near to God, and he will draw near to you, and this will help with that original problem of quarrels and strife and violence within the church, because if I'm laying self down on the altar before God, then I'm willing to say, you know what, I may be wrong here. In fact, I probably am wrong here. So let me listen to what you have to say. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. You know what? You're right. It's a grace to be able to say that. 
Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Because that time is not always. First uh, Peter chapter 5. I didn't mark the page, I'm sorry. This is one, it's one of the earliest verses I had to memorize as a kid. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. But be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. I had to learn verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walketh about, seeing whom he may devour. I would memorize that. Not verse 7. Cast your anxieties on Jesus, for he cares for you. <laughs> I still look back like, what was Mrs. Cordell thinking? She was the Christian ed director. To make sure that you were going to stay sober. Uh, yeah. Watch out for the devil, little Joshua. I was eight. Okay. So, I mean, still, yeah, it's a good verse. Still remember it, but wow. Yeah. But yeah, cast your cares on Jesus. He cares for you. Another good verse. Uh, the other, Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of God. Yeah. Resist the evil one. He, and he will flee from you. That's a great promise. Like he fled from Jesus after meeting the three temptations yesterday, like we saw in, in Matthew chapter 4. So this is an ongoing discipline. And we have here also, beginning at verse 8, some purity language. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, purify your hearts, you double-minded. James, of course, is writing to Jewish believers. They would have known exactly what he's talking about, the, the ritual cleansings as you came to worship in the temple. You didn't go dirty before God. You washed, your, washed yourself. We used to put our best clothes on before we came to church, right? You took a bath on Saturday night, whether you needed one or not, and you put on your good clothes. We've relaxed that a little bit, and that's fine, uh, as long as we're still recognizing we are coming into the presence of God. That, that was the important part, not that we had nice clothes on and, and were fresh and clean, but we were recognizing we're going into the presence of the king. And if you were going to go see Queen Elizabeth, you might, you might have a wash and, and put on a nice clean shirt. Maybe a hat, yeah. I think so. a lot of times that's forgotten. Yeah. That we're coming into the presence of God. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Well, in, in our culture today, as more and more people move away from having any sort of church experience, a lot of churches want to emphasize a different value, which is all are welcome. You are welcome as you are. That's and fine, but... We're not going to turn you away because you're not wearing the right clothes. But it's the presence of God that you're walking well, it's a Right. Place. And so hopefully that's reinforced from the pulpit or from the liturgy or the music or something like that. I struggle with that whole thing. Because Christ welcomed everybody. I mean, he, you know, the the the, the poor, the the the, the lepers, the I, I right. And God made us we were born naked, so it, what does it matter? Well we want you to cut clothes. I understand <laughs> that. If God cared about what I wore, he'd have right. I'd have been born with a suit on. <laughs> right, but at the same time, you are recognizing yourself. You are coming before the Lord. And you are expressing that in ways other than through your clothes. Right. You're expressing that in your attitude, which okay. is what really matters. We're, okay. okay. We're, for some people, we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah, for some people, the dressing up 
helped them get into that frame of mind. It was a way that helped them through that. So, but okay. we're not going to turn anyone away. Well, I like I, holes in their some people are going to take that as a challenge, and I don't want that to be a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think it I can't imagine that we would turn anyone away unless they were breaking laws. How about that? So, yeah, so don't be double-minded, also, he says. Um, and attend to your life. Humble yourself before the Lord. We've got some tough verses here. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Uh, that, to me, fits in with what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Um, I see that as recognize your brokenness and how you are welcomed in spite of that by the grace and love of God. So humble yourself before the Lord. Recognize just how much you need him. Grieve and repent over that. And those who are willing to do that and humble themselves will be lifted up by God. But those who come before God, like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable, and they don't really pray, but inform God how great they are. <laughs> you know, God, you really should be happy that I'm on your team. Because look at all the good things I do for you. Um, those will be humbled. Because God's eventually going to get us all in the right frame of mind, which is he is God and we are not. He's the creator, we're the creature. He's the redeemer, we're the redeemed. And if we don't recognize that ourselves, he cares enough about us to make us recognize that, sometimes in a rather shocking way. Mm -hmm. You know, the old joke, what, how big of a two-by-four is it going to take upside the head before you'll finally recognize that God's trying to say something to you. The, out on the black sign at the corner, God is speaking. Are you listening? Too often we have cotton in our ears or earbuds in our ears. Or what your mother said to her brother. Yeah, poor Uncle Arthur. Yeah. My uncle had a call to go to seminary long before he actually went to seminary. But he was not going to be like his big brother and his big sister's husband. He wasn't going to be number three. He was going to be himself. He was going to make money. And so first, he went working for Marsh Wheeling Cigars. And after a while, they folded. <laughs> and so then he started working at a Ford dealership. And after a while, it went bankrupt. And so then he started selling insurance. Have you ever heard of an insurance company going bankrupt? No. This one did. <laughs> and my, my mom finally pulled Uncle Arthur aside and said, how many businesses in the Ohio Valley have to go under before you go to seminary? <laughs> and he finally went, praise God, because it was already a bad enough economy then, you know? It couldn't take any more. That's a good story. So... <laughs> And she said it as only a big sister can say it. I've got two, I understand. So, humble ourselves, seek the Lord, seek to be godly rather than worldly, seek to be changed and transformed and purified. And with this, coming back to what we were talking about in chapter 3, verse 11, tame your tongue. Do not speak evil against the law, or do not speak evil against one another. Those who speak against a brother or judge his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, are you not a doer of the law? You're a judge. There's only one lawgiver and judge. In other words, if you start judging other people, guess whose job you're taking? God's job. Now, we have to be careful here. A lot of people read Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest he be judged. And they think that means we can never say that anything is ever right or wrong. That's not true. If you keep reading, right after that is the famous do not cast your pearls before swine teaching. 
well, I have to be able to make a judgment, don't I, over what are pearls and who are the swine. And as I keep reading that Jesus also talks about don't take don't try to take the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a log in your own eye. Well, yeah, Jesus is saying something about being hypocritical in my judgments. That is what he's saying. When you make your judgments, recognize the same measure you're using with others is going to be used with you. So be generous. Make sure you are examining your own life. Because it's not good for my brother to have a speck in his eye, is it? That's painful. He could go blind if that's not taken care of properly. So I do want to be able to help my brother or sister. And sometimes that means saying, I think you're getting yourself into trouble here. And I don't want you to go down that path. But when I make that judgment, I have to be willing to apply it to myself as well. We are called to speak the truth. And to stand for the truth, we have to do so in love. It's also prudent to discern <coughs> which people are the ones that you want to associate with. Right, yeah. And what your children to associate with. Yeah, you'll be known by the company you keep. And uh, But a lot of us are casting a lot of people into hell when it's not really our job to do that. Um, I think we're going to be very surprised at some of the people that God welcomes to be with him in all eternity and some of the people he doesn't. Um, but uh, that's God's job. And so, uh, you know, don't, don't be the one causing the problem. Don't be the one picking the fight. Don't be the one standing off on the side critiquing everybody and everything. Uh, Paul says in Romans, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. I love that verse. Because A, it's a big challenge. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. But it also teaches, doesn't it, it's not always possible. Some people just will not live at peace. But make sure you're not the one causing the problem. Make sure you're willing to make peace and welcome people when they repent and come back. Because sometimes they do. It's shocking when they do. But sometimes they do. God is at work. Oh. I'm sorry? Oh. Well, I thought you said bull. <laughs> She's going to argue with you. Wow, okay. Yes, Paul, correct. <laughs> so, I mean, but the other thing, when we critique other people, when we judge harshly and selfishly, especially in the church, we are critiquing the bride of Christ. We had a vivid illustration in the past week of somebody speaking out against somebody else's wife. It wasn't received well, was it? If you don't know who I'm talking about, talk to me afterwards. I'm tired of talking about it. But Mr. and Mrs. Smith at the Oscars. But people don't generally like it when you badmouth their spouse, right? So be careful about badmouthing the bride of Christ especially since you're part of it. So you're critiquing yourself as much as anything. As uh, Barclay said, if we are the bride of Christ, then God is a husband. And if we break a law, we're actually breaking a vow of marriage yeah, to God. Yeah, that's not good, is it? That's why he calls us adulterous when we chase after the the world rather than after him. And he vividly spells that out in the Old Testament in the book of Hosea. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. What, Hosea? Hosea, it's amazing. Yeah. I preached on it once. I did a sermon series. People got really tired of me talking about whores. I don't think I've read There's a lot of whores in Hosea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So... I'm sorry I kept you over, but as you see, there is a lot packed in that little section. 
Next week, we'll continue with chapter four and into chapter five. We're going to talk about boasting. We're going to talk about planning for the future. And then everybody's favorite topic, we're going to talk about money. So let's close with prayer. Lord, we desire to be wise. We don't want to be fools. We don't want to live foolishly. But we need your wisdom and we need your spirit to lead us and guide us to live in the best possible way. Help us, Lord, to be peacemakers. Help us to be godly. Help us to grow in Christ and to grow in our relationships. Help us, Lord, to be a blessing and to shine your light. And go with us now as we return to our homes and gather us together again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.